So today's lesson is about family history, um, the importance of obtaining it and the importance of displaying it and then interpreting that history um, so that we can help clients determine their genetic risk and help modify it or screen for diseases earlier than maybe we would have. By the end of this unit, you should be able to discuss the importance of obtaining a thorough family history from a client. You should be able to describe methods to collect and display that information. Um, you should be able to identify individuals at risk for health problems um, by virtue of family history who could use a referral to genetic counseling, somebody whose scope of practice is a little more specialized than yours. They have more information to share um, and more options to offer. You should be able to also construct a three-generation pedigree and determine some basic things about the probable transmission of a trait through a simple pedigree. Um, it's not an exact science. It's only as good as the information people give you and the information base that you already have. Um, but the family history is really important. Many, many, many diseases have their origins or at least a component that's based in genetic risk. Getting a family history from a client is a non-invasive, easy, affordable way to get that information um, about a patient's genetic risk factors. It needs to be accurate. It needs to be updated regularly. Um, it should be collected from several family members if possible. You should really encourage your patients to talk to their family members to find out about the conditions that um, run in their family. And it really should be a part of routine health care. Not necessarily when you go to the emergency room um, for a broken leg, but certainly when you go for prenatal care, when you go for routine annual exams with your primary care provider, they should be collecting some information about your family history. Um, some disorders, for example, malignant hyperthermia is one of those uh, conditions that unless you've been under anesthesia, you don't know you have it, but if a family member has reported life-threatening problems with anesthesia, that's important to let your provider know before they do any kind of surgery because they'll change the induction agents for that anesthesia. Other diseases may be polygenic in inheritance, cancer, for example. So if we know that a family history of cancer exists, even if we don't screen for the genes or we don't know where the genes are to screen for, um, we can usually schedule them for uh, earlier diagnostics. For example, colon cancer can run in families. Maybe we want to do a colonoscopy at 40 instead of at 50 um, for somebody with a family history. So it's really important to know um, what the family history is so that we can help people either mitigate their risk, detect diseases earlier, and treat them um, for better outcomes. So to this end, in November of 2004, the Surgeon General declared that Thanksgiving Day as the first annual National Family History Day, and it has been in continuance ever since. It may not be publicized all that widely, but it was thought that this is when Americans tend to gather as families, um, and maybe it's not the thing you want to discuss during the football game or the parade or dinner or even pumpkin pie, but at some point, somebody should have that conversation or should initiate that conversation. And usually you'll find that maybe there's a cousin who doesn't come to the family gatherings, but somebody keeps in touch with them and say, oh, you know, she's had a rough time. She was diagnosed with X, Y, Z. Um, and that can be updated. So there is also an online tool through the CDC because of this uh, family history initiative. I'm going to open it up for you. See if it's here. Yep, there it is. And you can just open up this form, okay? Fill out your name, fill out your date of birth, were you adopted, because that will make a difference. Um, and then you, I'm going to show you the drop down menus for all these diseases. So you can see that there are many, many diseases with um, familial components, <clears throat> even things septicemia. You know, that's an infection that goes into your blood. But there are certain risk factors that can increase your risk for that. Diabetes, dementia, psychiatric illness, some of these break out into even more um, categories. So heart disease could be coronary artery disease. It could be right ventricular 
dysplasia, things that we'll learn about later. Um, you want to select the age at diagnosis. Sometimes that tells us a lot about the severity of the disease. People who are diagnosed with heart disease at the age of 35 obviously have a much more aggressive and serious form of heart disease, more likely to be caused or have a contributing factor in your genetics. Um, there's information about ethnicity and race because those create risk factors. And you'll see here this question about Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. There are many disorders because of um, the population bottleneck among Ashkenazi Jewish folks. Um, for many centuries, they were sort of isolated and certain disorders run much more strongly. Breast and ovarian cancers, for example, Tay-Sachs disease, um, Foucher's disease. There are certain diseases that run very prominently in Ashkenazi uh, Jewish people or people with that ancestry, I should say. Um, so that is a tool that people are encouraged to use and share with their provider. It is one way to sort of collect that data and display it and people can share their results with other people in their families. Um, to take a family history from a person who hasn't brought you this nice clean tool, you can use an acronym called SCREEN. Do you have some concern? Are you concerned about any diseases that run in your family? And that opens up sort of a portal for people to discuss maybe something Alzheimer's runs in their family or breast cancer runs in their family. Um, and it, a lot of times people are terrified of those genetic diseases because it seems like this inescapable thing. You can't outrun your DNA. We know from last week's work that epigenomics does play a factor in some of these. Um, and so that can be a conversation that um, evolves when you're taking this history. Reproduction, have there been complicated pregnancies, infertility, or birth defects? Later this week, we are going to learn about translocations and other things, um, autosomal uh, inheritance disorders, where a, an obstetric history can sometimes point to a genetic disorder. Um, early disease or death, anyone in your family becomes sick or died at an early age. Again, if somebody had colon cancer at the age of 41, um, that would be an indication to screen everybody in that family much younger than we would screen the general population. If somebody died of a heart attack at age 42 and was a marathon runner, that's pretty significant for something that might be familial. So early disease or death is another risk factor. Ethnicity, how would you describe your ethnicity? And here is where um, sometimes you have to be sort of careful. People self-identify <clears throat> in any number of ways. Um, so sometimes you can sort of expand that conversation to say, and how do your parents, you know, what nationality, what ethnicity do they identify as? Um, and sometimes get that information from people. Non-genetic, are there risk factors that seem to run in your family for things you didn't know were genetic? So, for example, alcoholism, very strong genetic component that people might not realize because they think of it as a behavioral disorder or disorder of choice. Um, so we're going to ask about non-genetic diseases cleft lip and palate. Most people don't think of those as genetic. They really aren't. Technically speaking, they can be caused by teratogens, but there's a genetic vulnerability or susceptibility in some individuals and in some populations for things like that. Um, other things about taking a family history, the screen mnemonic is great, but it never hurts to have a standardized tool. And this is the kind of thing that those of you who are in practice settings um, should be looking at. Now, this is one questionnaire. It's a little bit blurry, but I'm going to see if I can blow it up. It has information. Birth mother is in bold, birth father, because people can identify family members as their mother or father who aren't their mother or father. Um, biologically speaking, they were, they took on that role as parents. Um, but that, if that is a social relationship and not a biological relationship. So that's important to know. It's important to know if people's parents are still living, what they died from and at what age, um, what diseases they carry. March of Dimes <clears throat> has another great tool. I'm going to open that up for you. Um, and it's information about both like prospective parents, um, information about ethnicity, information about things that might be teratogens, 
So prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, um, illicit drugs and nicotine. Um, and then here are the health conditions. So things that people might not associate with a genetic component often do have that. Autism, there is a strong genetic basis. In birth defects, including heart defects or spina bifida. Now, spina bifida, you might say, well, that's a deficiency of folic acid, but there are some embryos that are more susceptible to neural tube defects than others by basis of the way that they process folic acid. Um, blindness from birth or before the age of 40, blood clots, cancer, cystic fibrosis, all of these can have genetic components. <clears throat> and then there's some place for free texting. Um, they want to know about preterm babies. Then there are some links for people who want to do that. So this is a tool that can be used. A standardized tool can be really, really important when you're taking a family history. That way you don't miss anything. It's important to go in a systematic order and to ask specifically for things that are A, of interest to why that person came for care um, and B, uh, known to have a genetic component, the person might not think to volunteer. Um, genetics referral, when to refer to a genetics counselor. Well, part of our job when we're collecting all this information is to be able to stratify risk. Person at high risk for hypertension because three quarters of the adults in their family have been diagnosed with it probably should be referred. Um, a person with a his poor obstetric history should definitely be referred. If there's infertility, if there's recurrent miscarriages, sometimes those are red flags that tell us um, that the person has a problem in their chromosomes. Either there's a translocation or a duplication or an inversion. There's something that is interfering with the formation of viable, healthy gametes. If you have a child in your family with a developmental disability, it's also a good time to refer to a genetic counselor. All of these things have genetic components. And the best person to discuss the relative risk and odds ratio is not the generalist baccalaureate nurse who's working in a hospital or an outpatient setting. It's the person who has the training to do it. So the red flags, personal or family history of disease with strong genetic component um, the person's diagnosed with von Willebrand's disease, which is a bleeding disorder, or um, their father was diagnosed with Huntington's disease, which is an autosomal dominant disorder. Once you hear those things, you should be thinking, well, maybe this person needs a referral. Um, infertility or recurrent miscarriage, any kind of poor obstetric outcome, recurrent stillbirths, recurrent um, developmental disabilities, that person should also be. So here is your mnemonic for those red flags. We have F genes. F stands for family history. G, group of congenital anomalies. Obviously, you see a bunch of birth defects. You know that, that there's something that may be a genetic component. If it keeps happening, it's not you know just a mistake or an accident. Something is going on um, that warrants further investigation. E for extreme or exceptional presentation of common conditions. So diabetes is a common condition, but it's commonly, if it's type 2 diabetes, it's commonly diagnosed after the age of 40. If you're seeing it in individuals who are 18, 20, 25, um, that's extreme. That's exceptional. Um, if we are seeing heart disease, um, person dies of a heart attack at age 40, certain cancers, as I said, colon cancer at the age of 39, that would warrant further investigation. Um, neurodevelopmental delay is things like autism, intellectual disability, which could be caused by something like fragile X. Um, so that needs to be investigated. Degenerative disorders like Parkinson's, Huntington's, Alzheimer's, um, muscular dystrophy, Anything where the person develops normally and then has loss of function um, outside of normal aging would warrant some investigation. And any extreme or exceptional pathology, rare disorders, um, things that you don't see very often, cystic fibrosis, obviously, um, anything that's PKU, anything that is not a common condition that pops up in a family 
really warrants an investigation by uh, a genetic counselor. And we're going to stop there.